start off a little different than most uh, speeches since today is my dad's 60th birthday. Woo! I think we should all uh, partake in some singing uh, to close up this conference. So, uh, who can start off? Emily, you got the most. No, I'm not a singer. Uh, <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Junction, Texas. Um, our business is in dealing with helping people restore the earth. Uh, we do that primarily through 100% native wildflower and grass seeds um, and like to offer ecological solutions. <laughs> and uh, I think the title of the talk has something to do with uh, picking the right seeds to the place or native seeds. And uh, we're going to get into that and a couple other topics throughout this uh, presentation. But to start things off, <clears throat> This was a picture taken January 4th, 2012. And uh, the title there, Critical Times. What? I'd like to get some feedback from the audience. What, what does that picture mean to you? What do you see in that? Water. Water or lack thereof? I guess you see water in the ocean, but man, <coughs> I don't have a uh, laser, but. <coughs> Everyone knows the saying about water, right? Water is the basis of all life. And what happens when you don't have water? Then you have brown and, and straight earth, no, no vegetation. <clears throat> and if water is the basis of all life, then what are plants? Well, plants are the only organisms in the entire world that can capture the sun's energy and transform that into food. So it's the basis of the entire food chain. <clears throat> and that's what all the prairie is about. A habitat and a food source to support the entire food web of, of the earth. And this prairie is an ancient web of life. <clears throat> um, when you start bringing in non native species and, and disrupting the prairie, you're taking away the habitat that, that depends on that, or the wildlife that depends on that habitat. And um, there's an author of a book, Bringing Nature Home. I'm sure some of you in here have read, have read that book, but. Uh, he has a short little video that talks about the importance of native plants. And it goes something on the lines of plants are the only species that can capture the sun's energy and transform it into food. <clears throat> and the primary um, eaters of the plant would be insects. And insects have co-evolved with plants over hundreds of thousands of millions of years. <clears throat> and those insects can only survive on the plants they have co-evolved with. They are very particular in what they survive on, and that's called specialization. So certain insects can only eat a certain group of plants. And whenever you replace those plants with something that they can't eat, you're taking away their food source and um, diminishing their chances for success in life. And so if you uh, take, in, for example, the monarch butterfly, the only species it can eat are the sclepius or milkweed species. And when you start taking that away, you're taking away the monarch butterfly. When you take away the monarch butterfly, you're taking away anything that depends on that. And so it's like a... a Tropic cascade from the bottom up. That if you're taking away a certain <coughs> food source, then you're disrupting the entire web of life, and uh, that's something that we're trying to protect at Native American Seed. And I think that's what this whole conference is about: is protecting that. <coughs> so, how do you do that? Well, um, first you want to start with native species. You want to in include these plants in all sorts of landscapes: urban, rural, um, <coughs> and. And those plants will start bringing in these native insects, fungi, bacteria. Um, actually, whenever we do native harvest, we keep as much components as we can in our harvest. And those components support the, the, the microorganisms in the dirt, and they are transported with our harvest. Our chaff has microorganisms that support the, the bacterial life of the soil, which support the plants, which support the bugs, which support the birds. And so it's an ongoing chain. <clears throat> 
Here's a really nice picture of Gallardia and Gallardia Mom. And nature breeds resilience. Nature breeds diversity. Diversity is a way that nature protects itself. Um, through diversity, it, it's allowing the maximum amount of species to survive. <clears throat> and so whenever we start creating monocultures or slimming down our diversity, we're taking away that habitat that's available to our species. And this is uh, our legacy. Texas, the prairie is something what it's all about. And when you start taking that away, you're taking away the legacy of what we're going to pass forward to the next generation. It's just amazing. Pure native seeds and their inherent legendary genetics are complete, withstanding the test of time. <clears throat> to me, I think of that as um, people are pretty dumb and nature's pretty smart, and uh, I don't know how we can do something better than nature can. And uh, there's a lot of approaches and ways to, to do restoration or, or be good stewards of the land, and uh, our approach has always been to take what nature gives and put it back and uh, not try and overthink things. Get the most diversity you can, everything that's 100% native, and put it back in the landscape to support the wildlife which runs up the chain. And with that, I'm going to switch over to George Case. He's going to talk a little bit more about how we do that. Okay, so I'm George. Do I need the microphone or can everyone hear me this way? Uh, so here's Bill showing you how important the pieces are. Uh, this is a picture of some of the seed material that's been pre-cleaned in our seed cleaning plant after being returned from the coastal prairie harvests. Uh, this one in particular was done in Colorado County. So at this point you can see very long pieces of straw. And these are the pieces of what are, is called inert material. It really isn't so inert. It's probably got fungal spores, bacteria, insect eggs maybe. But for some reason or another, this, this component of seed mixtures is deemed uh, unacceptable in, in, the, in the seed industry. Well, we have to manipulate the material in such a way to make it flow through planting equipment. But we try our hardest uh, to keep anything and everything that's alive in that mixture. And we kind of, you know, coined the phrase ecosystem in a bag, and that's one of the components. But in that mixture, there's probably, you know, 40 to 50 species of seeds, even though it's dominated by a single one. So we could turn that into you know, a monoculture basically of seed by casting away all of the other pieces, all of the other micro components that are in there. But we kind of uh, believe that nature is smarter than we are, and so who are we to decide what survives, what goes extinct, and what doesn't? So if there is anything in there, uh, we'd like to try and keep it. These harvests, they come from places that have never been disturbed or plowed under, or they're uncontaminated with invasive species. We will not conduct harvests on places that have uh, components that are undesirable for restoration work. So if it's got KR blue stem, we're uninterested. If it's got Johnson grass, we're uninterested. And you know, we, we turn people down all the time and they're, they're sad about it, but what, what can we do? <clears throat> So like I said, direct from prairie remnants. So this is a really fun part of the work, is to go to places that usually aren't open to the public. A lot of times it's uh, public land that, it's, it's public land, but it's the part of the public land where they don't let the public go because it's such a critically imperiled habitat that uh, they want to protect it. And so uh, this particular rela relationship that's demonstrated here is with the National Fish and Wildlife Service that we return a portion of the harvest back to after it's been processed and they use those materials to expand and, and improve the quality and quantity of the refuge. It's currently at 10,000 plus acres and hopefully getting larger. We then 
take those seeds and bring them to market in areas you know, appropriately adjacent to those refuges. We don't try and sell that seed in Amarillo. So vice versa, you don't think you'd want to go take seed from Amarillo and put it here. But, you know, when we go to collect those things, <clears throat> we typically go in the fall and there's only a certain set of species that are available uh, in the seed mixture. And, you know, prairie component, prairie systems are much more diverse than that. So our target <laughs> is always to increase the quantity of diversity in each of our seed mixtures. So how do you go about doing that? And when you're talking about micro components and trying to generate enough of them to then blend back into those, those remnant harvests, uh, you have to do a little bit of multiplication. So this is our little farm on the plateau. Uh, and you can see all the different colors. Uh, those represent species, all of the little blocks, test plots. Some of them are one row of 150 feet is where we start. And then we try and get up to some of the larger fields. And our hopes are to keep going past the fence. Either way, all the way up and down the river valley, <laughs> if we can. Uh, and who knows, maybe someday set up a similar kind of process somewhere else. But basically what we're doing here is taking the last pieces of stuff and, and multiplying it into larger quantities to then add back into <coughs> A seed mixture, so we can depend on having them, so we can we can bring those to market on a on a regular basis. Uh, up above that, patchwork is uh, a whole area of infrastructure that is is used to process, store, uh, analyze, work with the end result of, of all of our efforts. And we don't go put a big PVP on any of that work. We believe that it belongs to each and every one of you, just as if it belongs to us. And we don't do that because we know that those plants know how to survive. Without our tinkering or meddling, they'll do just fine. You just got to put them where they're supposed to go. Can you imagine if you had to pay a fee to have access to those plant materials? Once, once you're growing that plant, yeah, I think you should be able to do with it as you see fit. So here's a little example of some of the, the stuff that we do. Is anybody familiar with silphium plants? Yeah, so this is Silphium albiflorum. This is a Texas endemic species that is, grows on the Tandy Hills Prairie up here. And uh, we were asked to produce this. So we went kind of all over Texas looking for it and came across a few collections. And here we have it. So we have four 150 foot rows of it. And who else is gonna make that available to you as restorations? And how do you put a how do you put an appropriate value on that work? How much should that cost a pound? So our work is full of that. I think we have somewhere between sixty and seventy species that we're working with like that at the moment. And you know things cycle through; they fade sometimes. Sometimes they're really successful, but we're always innovating and looking for the next thing and trying to figure out how this this plant, no matter how scraggly or how does that fit into a landscape, or how does that fit into a restoration project? How does it, how does it have value for someone? How does that make sense for protect? It's just a piece. But if we don't protect it, who will? And like I said, if it's, and like Wesley said, if it's not native, we don't want to touch it. We don't want, we don't want it in our seed cleaning facility. We don't want it in our seed mixing facility. We don't want it in our harvesting equipment, we don't want it on our lawn mowers, our shredders, our tractors, our employee shoes. We don't want anything to do with it. There's also some of these things that we're the only people that will grow it in the United States. 
think that has value. This particular crop, for example, is home to all of the ladybugs on River Run Ranch. That's our, not ladybugs, but uh, fireflies. So, lightning bugs, right? So a lot of people have grown up with lightning bugs but don't see them anymore. And this is pretty much the only place we find them in any kind of you know, abundance on, on the whole place. It's right here. So that's, who are we? I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know what, what <laughs> that relationship is, what's happening there. But for some reason, they are they like those plants. So it's our assertion that, man, if we pick that three acres up and moved it to the other side of the farm, that we probably have fireflies over there. This is our seed cleaning facility where we take those materials from the farm or from wherever. You can see our, some of our harvesting equipment there. Uh, and, and we process them in there, so uh, we don't want to bring anything in there that's contaminated. Occasionally, we deal with a, a cool season cover crop that um, is used for temporary erosion control that is ecologically benign. And, uh, you know, it's a commodity crop, so believe it or not, you know, there's bastard cabbage in it or something. And so we will, we, will, we will take that out, but then we have to, like, you know, sterilize our entire operation. So that's no fun. But we can, if we can, we will go to Great Lakes to avoid that. That's kind of what the inside of it looks like, and it's just all, you know, we built this. You don't go to some store and say, can they give me one of those seed cleaning plants, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, and it's trial and error, right? You have to learn. So let's say we're working with 60 species or whatever, you know, you have to, you have to develop a process for each one of those things. And then be sure that that process yields something that is a superior quality that will function for people when they take it and go and try and use it. You know, we do tiny little things to big, huge batches. You know, some years it's a drought and we don't, we don't get to get out and do stuff like that. But other years it's good. So we have to store this material. You know, seeds are stable in the, in the correct kind of environment. So you know, we test them every nine months. We keep them sometimes for nine years. So guess what? Every time you go to test the viability of that seed lot, somebody's got to pay for that. But we feel it's important. How, how are we to know what, what's going out the door otherwise? And so this is what that kind of turns into. And I know that Jaime gave a big presentation about don't show numbers and <laughs> things like that. But I just want everybody to know that um, you know all of our seeds are tested Every nine months, we have an extensive database and record-keeping system that we use to generate seed mixtures. And it all boils down to this right here. Live seeds per square foot. So when you go to plant a mixture of seeds, there's going to be a certain number of seeds in each square foot of land if you distribute the material evenly. And so what we do is try to calculate out an appropriate mixture based on the requirements that the landowner has given us and or our catalog measures, which Emily's going to talk a little bit about that here in a minute. Uh, something like this only makes sense on a large scale. When you're talking about 100 square feet, you're not, we're not going to go take out a little teaspoon of each one of these things for your particular mix. Nobody can afford that. So uh, we just have made kind of off-the-shelf mixes that work in regionally appropriate environments. But, you know, then again, we can get a total. Here, here's your thing. This is, you know, here's your acres, here's your, here's your seeds per square foot. And we do that off of data like this. And if anybody wants to know how this works, I'll be happy to explain it, but I don't want to slow the presentation down to do that. Um, okay, there's some interesting things on here, though, that I do want to address. Okay, one, this is, a, you see where it says, kind standing cypress. Okay, so this is a flower. So in the state of Texas, the seed laws say that this, it's not required that you test these flowers for sale because they're not commodity crops. Okay, so if it's not a grass and it's, if, if it's not above 5% of the mix, then it need not be tested for any of this information. But we do it anyway. With everything that we have, we test. So we know it's purity, it's germination rate, it's dormant, whatever. We, and, if, and most importantly, 
right here, this category. Weed seeds, 0.02%. Well, what's the weed? Oh, I cut it off. It was, I think it was... Uh, Pigweed. Pigweed, right? Okay, so <laughs> let's, let's say that was Bermuda grass, right? Okay, so there you go, and you're, you've worked so hard to prepare your soil to receive these, <laughs> these seeds, right? And lo and behold, there is the 0.02% that somebody's going to have to deal with. So, it's very important for us to know, hey, look, you know, we've got a problem here. We, this needs to go back through. We need to cut that thing off. Pigweed, in fact, though, is a native plant. It's an early successional native plant that uh, can be problematic if uh, it is in a huge you know, abundant, but one plant here or there is not really going to be the end of the world. So, we're not coming to do your half acre suburban lot with, with this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> At least you better hope we're not. <laughs> uh, but, you know, for us in our work, this is, this is kind of like, if you want to change the world, you're going to need this about 15 to 20 times over. You know, we take those clean native seeds and we put it in our clean equipment. That is, you know, we had to wash every one of those, blow out all everything, make sure there's not a weed seed one in it. So, on your restoration project, can you say that your contractor has done the same? We don't ever run weeds or non-native species through our harvesting equipment, our seed cleaning plant, our mixing machines or our seed drills, 100% and it works. Our system works. This is Ed's project, uh, maybe six weeks after seeding, and bear in mind he did get four inches of rain on top of it, but uh, those seeds would have sat there in that dirt for five or six years. The, the rains came at the right time. This is year two. <laughs> so, you know, things change. It, you saw earlier how the seed, the standing cypress was dormant. So if I could go back one, you wouldn't see any standing cypress, but there it is. So just because it doesn't come up right away doesn't mean that your seed is no good. So that, that was the end of my yeah. talk Before about. we get into the next part, I wanted to share with you guys something, you wanna go back one? Something really exciting and new that we're working on um, to celebrate our 25th year. We started 25 years ago. Um, and for the last 25 years, we have always, I don't know how many people get our catalog in the mail twice a year. We do one in the spring, one in the fall, and we have a really nice website that people can go on our website and order native seeds. But within the last year, we've started working with local, um, you know, family-owned native nurseries around the state of Texas um, to get native seeds, such as these bags right here, into their stores. That'll have the information from our website and, um, you know, the seed test information on the back that you need and more information about, you know, what the benefits of these natives are um, to give people access to uh, diversity. Access to this. Yeah. So we have 39 stores, I already say that, and you can find a list of them on our website. There's several, uh, a lot in the Austin area, some up here in North Texas. We need more in the Houston area. Um, and if y'all have an idea of a good nursery to work with, let us know. And we really like to build uh, long term relationships with these nurseries, and we actually go visit them, uh, do plant classes for their staff and also for their. Their customers as well. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Because we've been thinking this, this, trying to think this through in the Houston area. How do we get more natives, and what are we trying to communicate? Could you do a display like that at a place where people, like a Whole Foods market, where people are, tend to be more environmentally friendly? It's not a nursery, but people's they were even primed. Yeah. That they just know they need to know what to plant. So yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be a nursery. nursery. Okay. Yeah. They have barcodes on them, I think, so. Ding, ding. Yeah, we're on high tech now. We yeah. Have <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. It's all in house. We have the printers, we have the designers, and we have the seeds in the bags, so we put it all together. Yeah. So it's, yeah. 
Yeah, and the and the hermetic was healed with a two year three year shelf life. Yeah. Do you just have the mixes or do you have these results? Both. We're working on the idea would be, you know, we have all of this uh, what we offer in here available, you know, in this type of a package that would have the information on the package. I don't know if y'all are familiar with our old school packaging that we've been using, but it's basically just a plastic bag with the label on it that has the seat test information and the name. But it doesn't tell or educate the people that are, you know, picking it up what's in the bag, what kind of seat. I think Dad's going to talk a little bit about creating models in our communities or something. <laughs> <laughs> Starting at home. Bringing it home. Yeah. Yeah. Bring it all home. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, uh, Emily and George and Weston, and thanks for the happy birthday song. Uh, <laughs> what a nice place to have a birthday. So. The, the theme of the conference, though, is the challenge about finding uh, and selecting the appropriate native seeds and their availability in, in that question. And amazingly, there are some of us that have been in this to the point of getting, like, <coughs> white hair. And uh, we were asking these same questions 25 years ago. And uh, something is good about that, that says that there are young people that are coming to replace the old white-haired people at some point. And, uh, <clears throat> but there's also something about that question that is, uh, to me, I, find, I what used to be upset and anxious or uh, uh, apprehensive about that the question and the reality is that nature is really is resilient and it, there's abundance if you show a little care to nature it will respond I think that people quit talking with the plants and the plants realize they're being ignored and they just kind of fade away I think that's what's happened with our people as a whole that we're not touching the land and the earth enough, and which is very hard to do when we spend most of our time rolling on concrete. And, uh, <coughs> but I do feel really comfortable and at ease with that question about is, are there seeds out there? And are, will there be enough and all of that kind of question? They're there. And uh, with a small amount of care and a little bit of listening and a lot of common sense and a whole lot of hard work, there can be made abundant seeds. There, there already are abundant seeds. This, we probably could plant five to 10,000 acres of coastal prairie, I know, easily. And there's, there, we have some demand for that, and so we're putting our energy if there was a five to 10,000 acres demand for Blackland and Prairie, we know where those remnants are. We know how to talk to those partners and to show them some extra care. And they will, they, they're resilient. They want, to, they want to come back. They want to expand themselves. And they're waiting for the humans to, to show up that, that, that are ready to do the work. I don't want to drift or have you feel like I'm drifting off of the subject or the theme, but I wanted to show a couple of other things that I think is important as we tell our stories. And uh, it is true that there are times, critical times, and times of drought that we've got to be patient and learn how to cooperate with the conditions that, that we are given. And uh, in 2011, there was a, a paradigm shift. I think there was an epic shift occurred in, in our climate. <coughs> Whoops. How did you do it? Pardon me? It seemed like you're right. You did. <laughs> 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 the, the 
Texas uh, Commission on Environmental Quality showed up in junction at our, uh, in our community. They had a helicopter uh, with shooters and, and uh, bulletproof vests. And then they had eight pickup trucks and they went to every uh, water rights permit holder on the river to ensure that their pumping would had ceased. Uh, they, they basically suspended our water rights. And this was on July 13th of 2011. And so <coughs> we had already voluntarily shut down uh, about 60% of our production. We had realized that 2011 was not a normal year and that we, it was in vain to try and, when we finished a, a harvest, to turn around and we would normally plow down our residue and replant the next, the next crop. And we just stopped our production and let the fields lay idle as that drought played out. After the whole thing of our water rights being taken away, we, I realized we've got to do some things personally, ourselves. And <clears throat> Weston had come home from college and uh, had done a couple of interns and uh, he had a burning interest in in the issue of water. And so we, he designed and built a couple of rainwater harvest systems on some of the facilities on, at our operation. And this is our seed cleaning plant on the backside of it. And my, uh, my shock there, I'm kind of going over the bill that he handed me of how much that cost to build that darn thing. <laughs> And as he likes to say, that's him looking at me pretending like he's listening to me. <laughs> uh, but here is a solar panel up here that drives a 12-volt pump that he put in here. And there's a whole bunch of uh, complicated, well, it's not that complicated, but there's five or six stages of filtration in there, including a UV light uh, that runs off the grid, the whole thing. We, on, on the significance of the first slide we show, he showed of January 4th, 2012, when the whole North America was, there was no snow and there was no green plants on this side of the planet because of that drought of 2011. <coughs> uh, we're off the grid now. We have a model here that our, my personal home this thing drains down to me and, uh, and Jan. The other one that uh, is another place on the ranch that he did a, his first one uh, with smaller tanks and it worked so well. So we, we did this. <coughs> and what does this have to do with seeds? 70% of our drinking water goes on landscapes. And that's a big deal in Texas right now. We, could simply or essentially double our water if we would just look at our landscape. But we are still not talking about that, really. I mean, we might be talking about it uh, bouncing around the edges in a room like this, but I'm talking about our people at, as a whole. We're not even, this is not much of a discussion. But for me, I wanted to uh, have this paradigm shift that happened to me with this worst drought on record by far. And uh, this is the front side of my house that since I've already dedicated my home use of rainwater now, but I didn't even do it on my roof of my house, I figured why don't I set up a model of how to rethink the landscape and use the rainwater off the house as the irrigation. So I can I just got on the tractor and just started, and I let the land and the, you know, kind of convey to me how this might work out. I didn't have a plan. I just jumped on the tractor and took off. And I regraded the whole thing to catch water <coughs> instead of to shed water. Now that flies in the face of what landscaping is all about. I spent the first 18 years of my life doing landscape construction and we would just bald smooth everything and shit that water. If you left a mud puddle in somebody's yard, it was a disaster. That was just, you would never do that. 
<coughs> I set it up and we had a big rain that followed it and I saw that it could work. There, there's a numer, uh, a number of catch basins that were designed and swales to direct water from the gutters and to hold it on the land as long as possible. And when one catch basin filled up, it overflowed and then began to fill the next one. And there's a series of them. Here's the gutter. The water, this particular one I made to split half of the water comes this way and then flows into this basin. But the other half flows around the back side of this and goes down into there. So there was some fun and kind of uh, some nice gentle lines that I could make uh, a landscape out of. This is on the roof looking straight down. <coughs> After I got all that done on the ground, then I made the design. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, it flies in the face of, uh, of what our what we normally do as a people. We have a guy sitting under fluorescent light bulbs that draws the plan first, and then he goes and forces it onto the land. So, <clears throat> but I just did this as if <clears throat> I then placed an order at Native American City, and I had it shipped to me, and we had a whole bunch of pictures of all this, and I'm not going to go through all that, but we ended up with something like 72 species. 13,000 square feet. <clears throat> it's a 13,000 square feet uh, area. We covered the whole thing with erosion blankets, is what that is. Net free wood fiber erosion blankets. a green tinge starting to come through. There is my pencil that I use to show about what's going on down at ground level, which is really where things are happening. You can't really do this kind of work uh, by going 60 miles an hour looking out your windshield. <coughs> We got lucky we had a good spring that followed up and got us going. I mow that place one time a year in February and just kind of scalp it down and let it regenerate itself. Some of these comments came up yesterday about how uh, I've learned as my hair uh, turned color and we are in this critical times that you need to show up at the table unless you don't mind being on the menu. And uh, <laughs> we showed up uh, down at the Capitol to speak about some native seed legislation that was being proposed that, that uh, we were trying to raise the awareness of the legislators. So this stuff, this kind of work with <clears throat> the seed selection and the availability issues, it, it's more than what it looks like and it's from the bottom to the top. From Austin to down on your hands and knees in your own place. Setting up models. We have school kids now that come and we'll take and break a piece of our staff off and we will show them and help people for the future. So I know people think that native seeds are very expensive. If we ever have any extra money, you can see the kinds of things that we're going to do uh, to try and get more people to use them. The more people that use them, I think it's just like the early adopters of any kind of technology, even like the iPhone or even a computer. At some point, it gets to, the, to a critical mass where then it becomes an economy of scale. And I think the people in this room are the ones to carry that to that next level.
This is right off my porch. <laughs> From that same landscape. Texas cut grass. Pardon me? I said you didn't paint a sparrow, did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't have these in Houston. <laughs> but you could. You could. <laughs> this has some sound that goes with it that tells a little bit of a story, but it wasn't worth the hassle to hook the wire up. <laughs> but uh, this is a direct from both seats, from the rain capturing off of the roof because the state took our water rights away because we're in an epic critical time. And it doesn't have to be uh, a sign of desperation. You can take lemons and make some something nice out of it. I think I'd like to open up uh, to all of the people that have addressed uh, this presentation, any kind of questions or comments about anything that you'd like to about Native American seed. Thank you.